This is the very first episode of Sox Degrees, the inaugural podcast. Uh, Len Casper, Jason Benetti, and we are so thrilled to be joined by the White Sox Senior Vice President and General Manager, Rick Hahn. Hi, Rick. Hey, guys. It is, a, is an honor and a privilege to be your first guest on the inaugural podcast. So the good news is it's only, uh, only up from here. <laughs> so the first That's question, not true, <laughs> by the way. What's that? That is not true when you say it's only up from here. Uh, there was complete consensus that you would be the perfect first guest. Now, I'll let Jason explain to you why we came to that consensus. I'd like to actually ask the first question on this podcast and have it be, is it really an honor? <laughs> it is an honor. Mm. Who knows how long this thing's going to last? And I can say I was on one of them. <laughs> the very first one. Uh, you're, you're the perfect first guest because this being Sox Degrees, we have people who are going to be way outside the Sox universe and then people very, very close to the White Sox universe. And I think you're sort of the hub here of our concentric circles, if we can be philosophical for wow. a moment. That's, that's deep and yeah. seems like a lot of pressure on me, but I'm, I'm willing to bear that, uh, carry that water. So that's the point. <laughs> it was to load the pressure on you. <laughs> so we can ask you very difficult questions and make you tense. Fire away. <laughs> uh, for me, for you, when is the first memory you have of loving the game of baseball? Oh, wow. What a great question. You know, and this probably is not going to be hugely popular with White Sox Nation, but unfortunately my uh, uh, first memory takes place probably uh, about eight miles north of here. I believe it was the home opener, I think, in 1978. Uh, my dad and three of his buddies used to go every year to the Cub home opener, and uh, I think 78 was the first year they took me. And they, I believe, and someone will be able to, you know, look up on Roto World or on, uh, on Baseball Reference and prove my recollection completely faulty <laughs> after this podcast <laughs> airs. But my memory, rightly or wrongly, uh, is that the Cubs were tied in the bottom of the ninth. And I believe it was uh, Bittner, Mercer, and Kingman coming to bat is my recollection. And one of my dad's buddies... Uh, who at the time seemed like he was probably 60 and in reality was about 30, uh, 35 maybe. And he had a couple, a couple of beverages that afternoon, uh, as, as those are some are wont to do at Wrigley. And he started the uh, chanting, we want a home run. And to my seven-year-old mind, the entire stadium then started chanting, we want a home run. And my recollection is Bittner hit the ball out and the Cubs walked it off and won the home opener. And I felt it was because of my dad and his buddies. So that's, uh, that's my first baseball recollection of loving the game. That's, um, that's quite the power that your dad and his friends had. Well, like I said, he had a few pops and I think he had a hot dog and in inning too. So he was, he was about as powerful as a person can be in a seven-year-old's eyes at that point. So, okay, so that happens. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? burgeoning love of baseball like what were the next couple weeks oh, oh boy I don't know if I can go right to the last couple of weeks I do remember or the next couple of weeks I do remember uh you know growing up in Winnetka I remember attending Hubbard Woods School which was the grammar school over there and uh there were TVs in all the classrooms and occasionally you know they'd be for you know a shuttle launch or a presidential address or a, I believe uh Salt II Treaty being signed on TV was something that we were supposed to watch on TV in the class. Every once in a while. Every once in a while. Every so often. Salt II, three, whatever it takes. <laughs> 220, 221. Uh, and I remember uh, I had a couple of teachers that I was able to convince at the end of the school day to turn on the Cub game. Uh, if we were, you know, met certain milestones or whatever I was negotiating at the time to let us watch some Cub games. Oh, yeah. So at the end of the day, we watched a little Cubs in, uh, in the classroom, and then I'd usually run home and turn it on the TV and uh, be uh, uh, have my afternoon start and put off my homework watching watching the game. Everyone, or not everyone, but people who have paid too close attention uh, to my redundant stories knows that uh, right around that time I started writing letters to Dallas Green, who was the Cubs GM at the time, uh, with various trade ideas. And, and uh, unfortunately for Dallas, he was kind enough to respond to me. And right. uh, as a result, we had a a, a series of ongoing exchanges, but that was uh, that was probably early uh, seeding of my interest in, in the more executive side of the game. So what I want to ask is, what do you think? I've read the letter. 
What do you think that letter says about young Rick Hahn? Uh, well, it's, it, it says he didn't like Bill Buckner. Yeah. But in reality, I was just trying to make room for Leon Durham. <laughs> was was up what I was looking to do. I wanted Bull playing more, and, and Buckner was was blocking him. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think it. Uh, I think it shows uh, the belief that uh, this game is accessible to anyone. Uh, perhaps from my chair now, it, it shows a. a naivete about how easy the job is <laughs> and how uh, simple it is to execute a trade. Uh, but certainly at that time, it, it I think, spoke to uh, not only my passion when I was young, but the fact that everyone feels like they can should have a voice or has a voice in, in coming up with various ideas and trying to help a team win. Len, are you thinking what I'm thinking? That if Twitter was around oh, God. back then, <laughs> little Rick Hahn's Twitter would have been a flamethrower no, about was, baseball ideas. I was, I was, I was sure I was extremely well reasoned and thought out any of my <laughs> commentary at the time. Well, no, I'm curious <laughs> if, if what it's like for you now, do you get that letter from 11 year old Joe, whomever, Basically who says, Eddie. yeah, <laughs> wet butt, <laughs> wet butt 23. <laughs> and at the very least, you have to get a kick out of it. And that, that has to take you back to your childhood. I do. And, and, and quite frankly, in, in somewhat of a, I don't know, paying it forward or respect to Dallas kind of way, I always respond when it's, when it's a kid. So, so anyone who's listening, who's 34 and has some aggressive ideas, just write them with your opposite hand and pretend you're a child and you'll hear back from the GM of the White Sox. <laughs> I, I actually did want to ask you about those moments now that give you deja vu. I, I have them and it's hard to verbalize, but there are moments at the ballpark, maybe it's a time of game or just a player pops into my head from the past. Do you, do you have those moments in this game where it takes you back to being a kid again? I, you know what? It, it's funny, Len, because... Obviously, there's a decent amount of stress involved in any of these jobs in the ballpark. Um, and I had to, you know, especially early on in my GM tenure, I had to remind myself to try to appreciate some of this time, to appreciate the fact that I literally have a key to the back door of the ballpark and can access it as I wish and walk through the tunnel from my car every day and get to wander out on the fresh grass. I mean, things that, like, 12 or 13 year old me would have just been over the moon that that was that was possible and that was in my art my future uh and I don't I, I try not to take any of that for granted and and I was you know been fortunate enough to have my my boys you know growing up and loving the game and being able to see it through their eyes from time to time uh you know I do think perhaps they've uh I've spoiled them too much like when you know, I, when they were really young we'd go up to Miller Park and just catch a random Brewer game just to get away and be fans and not really care about who wins. And I remember driving up there one day, my younger child, Charlie, asked if there was going to be a TV in our suite. Uh, And I had to explain to him that we were, no, (laughs) that's not how people attend games normally. And and we are going to attend games sitting outside and having some secret stadium sauce on a brat. We're going to enjoy it without a damn TV today. (laughs) (laughs) But for the most part, they've been able to keep me humble and be able to see the game through their eyes, which helps. Now, I don't know if Jason's done this. I've had the the pleasure of of sitting uh, with some team executives watching their team play. And uh, it's scary. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm guessing you've had those moments where you just are so invested emotionally and it's hard to keep that even keel right but do you have to remind yourself in the sixth inning of a a game on uh, june 18th that the world's not going to end if we don't win this game right and, and you're absolutely right as you lose that perspective especially in baseball we're, we're fortunate to play 162 I, I couldn't i couldn't do the equivalent job in football like you lose on a sunday and have to wait a week to get another chance like to get that taste out of your mouth i, I couldn't do that and there are certainly times that I need to remind myself there's another one tomorrow you know sometimes in fact you have to lose the battle to win the war based on player health or some things you're trying to develop on the field uh that said I I think you know my family would and probably my coworkers too would would tell you I don't behave great during ball games uh that I'd frequently lose that perspective uh but I wanted I I like 
to at least think I've gotten a little better with it and a little more mature in the approach. Uh, I do probably like everybody, you know, you go into a series or a road trip or a homestand and you, you sort of try to think through, okay, what, what would I be happy with here? Obviously you want to win every game every night and certainly in the fit of the battle, that's what you're expecting. But when you look at a trip, a, a tough road trip, um, you figure you go, you know, four and three on this thing. Okay. That's, that's a good result. And you try to remind yourself when you've won the first four out of five and you're losing game six, you try to remember that perspective you had before it started. <laughs> and I just want to follow up on this too, because um, my experience is about control in a way. So I think Jason, when you and I are working, you can take some of the emotion out of it. And when you're not like all of that comes to the fore. So when you're making a big trade or you're ready to sign somebody, you're probably not screaming and jumping for joy when like the deal gets done. Um, you're happy inside, right? But is it the loss of control almost makes you more emotional where you're watching a game and literally you're oh, just yeah, sitting yeah, there. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. That, that's, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's, that's the hardest part by far is that somehow I've managed to choose a profession where the most important part of the day I have zero control <laughs> over in reality. And, uh, you know, the vagaries of a bouncing ball or, a, you know, the, the approach of a 23 year old is going to dictate my mood and ultimately arguably my level of success in my chosen industry, uh, which I would not recommend. Uh, so yeah, when you're, when you're doing a trade or you're doing a free agent signing or, or making a roster move or whatever, uh, sure you're aware of the risk or the downside or the excitement of the upside. Uh, but you have control over that. That's the job. It's like what anyone does. This is what I do. These are the factors factoring into my decision, and this is ultimately what we as an organization decided to do, and I feel good about it. Watching a game in the fourth inning or, you know, seeing someone bunt or not going to the pen, you know, that I have to just watch that like everybody else. And, and uh, uh, although I might get to have a conversation about it the next day and impact the next few games, uh, at the time, you're, you're helpless, and that's a weird feeling. So what have you broken while watching a game? <laughs> Hearts. Hmm. <laughs> I didn't say at prom at Nutrier. I wasn't being figurative. <laughs> what have I broken? Uh, certainly, m many remotes. Many, many? remotes. Uh, no, more, uh, plenty. Enough. Enough. <laughs> Enough that I should stop throwing remotes. Uh, I threw a laundry basket within the last seven days. I was doing laundry and and chucked the laundry basket across the room and very narrowly missed. My wife doesn't know this. I very narrowly missed the lamp sitting next to the bedside. Um, yeah, so that's not great behavior. I'm I'm, I'm 50 years old and a grown ass man with a <laughs> big time job. I should not be throwing things. So, next question. <laughs> but that's sports, though, right? It is. Like sports, we all look right. at ourselves and we say, "Why am I doing this?" Right. And look, I, I, I'm half tongue in cheek in that look. It, but we you should threw all the laundry, be so. We should all the laundry basket. 100. percent right? yeah. 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 Okay. Within the last week. Uh, <laughs> We should all be so lucky that we get to do something that we're passionate about. And I, and I don't, when I'm, even though I'm making fun of myself or the behavior and all that, it is rooted in, in giving a damn and being passionate. And we should all be so lucky to get to do something like that. And I've been very fortunate that that's the path my life has chosen, as, as frustrating as it may be in the random seventh inning of a given game. <laughs> what, what are the rules in the Han household <laughs> that can be considered hypocritical by your kids. Oh, well, the language is more colorful than they should be using over the course of their day-to-day -day life, I'd like to imagine. That, you know, they're, one of them's heading off to college in a few weeks or a few months, and the other one's uh, going to be a junior in high school, and I'd like to see think that they comport themselves during their day to a much higher standard than they see their father displaying during a ball game. Um, so yeah, there's, there's all sorts of hypocrisy in my house. Now, the, the fact is, is like, I get a lot of nervous energy when a team's on the road and, and I'm at home watching the game uh, and, and when I'm not on the trip. I, I, I tend to wander, like the multiple TVs in the house are on the game, so I can, when I sort of sense poor behavior coming on the kids will stay in a certain room and i'll go somewhere else and then usually the dog will follow me trying to calm me down and cuddle up and you know hugo's powers only know certain limits so, <laughs> well, so the it. dog's aware of oh when the an dog's opponent's 100%. rally is happening he can tell he can tell when dad gets up off the couch and goes somewhere else and starts chewing gum or pacing or he'll come right up next to me and, and try to calm the 
diffuse the situation, so to speak. Chewing gum is the thing, huh? I chew a, a lot of gum. Uh, it's funny. Years ago, you guys may remember, we did this uh, show for MLB Network called The Club, where it was sort of like following mm-hmm. behind the scenes. And it was mostly, you know, it was all real footage, but being videotaped all the time, you sort of felt it and wasn't quite as real as the real world. Um, and it wasn't until I saw some of those episodes that I realized that I chewed way too much gum. Like I was constantly chomping in those things. And I'm like, that, that just looks stupid and it's just a bad <laughs> habit. And, but there are t- certain times, each game I'll go into the clubhouse, I'll grab a handful of gum, put it in my pocket, and in various situations I will, I will still go to it during the game. Uh, I want to, before we move on to a different topic. Uh, I want to talk about this all day. <laughs> well, I know. Glenn, honestly. I have to protect the innocent, uh, so I can't name names. But I uh, was doing a game in Houston and got word from, this was a television game, got word from our producer, uh, we're going to have to do something with the crowd mic because there's some fan sitting down in the field and it's just, you know, F-bomb city and, you know, every other pitch they're just, we're going to have to cut out the uh, what they call the effects mics, which pick up home plate. And I said, and, and, and the team executive called and said, I'm hearing this on my, my home television, so you know I'm getting phone calls from fans. So I had talked back to talk to the producer off the air, and I said, yeah, um, <clears throat> our, our general manager's sitting in the booth next door. You're picking that up on That's our microphones. <laughs> and I said, I don't think you can, you can kill our headsets it's this is not i said now for public consumption you can say yeah there's a there's a rowdy you know astros fan down in the front row but yeah our gm's next door to us and he's losing his mind with every pitch yeah that's so, on you're brand. not alone that's Rick. on brand that's on brand and and, uh, and uh, frankly it was one of the more difficult things uh of the 2020 pandemic season is that there's no fans and there was more than one occasion where i felt like oh crap they can hear me on the field cursing a certain move or whatever even your like, body language there's yeah. nobody in the park yeah so if you can there, you it know. gets picked up yeah. it gets picked up and scott reiford on more than one occasion last year be like you can be seen just so you know you can be seen by the media that's here so you know <laughs> uh i'm interested in what kind of law student you were <laughs> retired <laughs> were you a gunner uh like what kind of student were you look when i was in law school that's a yes for no gunner. no when a gunner, the, a gunner. Just let me explain. Yeah, explain a gunner it. is somebody who is just sitting in the class and wants to answer every oh, question, God, no. hands up no, the whole time, no, no, sniping no. from the back row. No, look, I, I will. I I did have one gunner tendency, which I will cop to, and that was I was, as you know, Jason. I've been to law school, or anyone listening who's gone. At the end of the year, you know, you study for the exam that's 100 percent of your grade, and most people make an outline to of the whole class, and that's what you study from. You know, it's 40, 80 pages, whatever. Uh, I would work on my outline each day. So I, like, I'd come home from class, do my outline for that day, and be done with it. So at the end of the semester, I didn't have to spend days upon days putting it together. That arguably is a gunner-like tendency, and I took a lot of crap from my buddies for that. Uh, but in terms of class, look, I was, uh, I was right out of college, and I was uh, in law school trying to figure out a way to get into what I'm doing now, which, as silly as it sounds now in the age of, of Theo Epstein and, and Andrew Friedman and John Daniels and others that have come before me with non-playing backgrounds, back in the mid-90s, this just wasn't a path. Like, it was all former players or, or somehow uh, connected to on-field activity that got moved into the front office. So it was a uh, – there was no real obvious way for someone like me to get into the game. So – I spent most of my time in law school trying to figure out a way to to get in and spent a lot of time writing letters to teams. And if I was fortunate enough to get a form letter back, I figured it, I, I felt like it was a win. Uh, very few teams wrote me back something personal, mostly usually just saying you don't have the proper background or you're overqualified or this just isn't a fit for you. Um, so I, you know, I did I did fine in law school and and didn't particularly enjoy the substance of it and knew I wasn't really going to practice law. Uh, made some great friends, but really spent most of the time trying to figure out, boy, what's next? Cause I don't think I'm on the right path. Look, I was, I was sitting, uh, my wife and I met in law school. We were classmates 
And at the time, third year of law school, it's like April, right before graduation. And I'm, I'm sitting in her apartment and I'm reading Baseball America. And Peter Gammons, as you guys will recall, used to, his, he used to write for The Globe and he used to write for Baseball America. And I'm reading his Baseball America column and he's talking about the next wave of baseball executives. And he mentioned, I think, Dee Podesta and Josh Burns and a handful of others who at most were maybe assistant GMs then, but most likely were a little lower. And he talked about these guys have all gone out and gotten a different type of MBA. They're all smart enough to go get a master's of business administration, but instead they took low level jobs and worked their way up and are getting masters of baseball administrations. And I had turned to my then girlfriend, now wife, and said, you know, I, I screwed this whole thing up. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm two, I'm three weeks away from getting a Harvard law degree. And I'm like, my, I'm adrift. I've made horrible mistakes to get here. I should have been doing this. I should have been getting coffee, picking guys up at the airport and working my way up through a front office. Like, that's what I want to do. That's what I'm passionate about. Not, not this. Uh, she rightfully, you know, ignored me and said, we'll figure it out, <laughs> which we, we did. <laughs> so then, then what? Well, I was, you know, I, I lacking foresight uh, or or a coherent plan. Uh, that was then, by the way. That was then. Some people don't now, take this now, out of context they will. as a drop. Oh, they will. Don't worry. Sports radio. <laughs> they will. They Chris will. Tannehill listens to this <laughs> podcast, I'm sure. Uh, we can go down a whole different path if you want to do that. We, we um, um, at the time, you know, I, I, I decided I would go to business school right out of law school. And what I mean by not having a coherent path is I wound up getting a JD and MBA in five years, which if you had originally planned to do that up front, you could do in four. Uh, but I, I did enjoy, to the extent that I was exposed to it as a, as a law student, as a summer associate, uh, venture capital law. Oh. And this was back in the mid to late 90s, and venture capital was booming, in the, in, particularly in the Bay Area. So I figured going to business school uh, under the auspice of learning more about finance, potentially could help advance a career either in venture capital law or as a venture capitalist. In reality, I spent the whole time trying to get into the baseball teams again. Uh, so it really just bought myself another two years. Uh, ultimately, after uh, after business school was when I, I started. I, it was time to turn pro. And that's when I went to go work as a, as a player agent, which at least combined somewhat what I was trained to do with what I was somewhat interested in. When you started talking about venture capital, I was picturing you as an extra in the social network <laughs> with like the Winklevoss twins. Right, and that right. didn't seem to fit to me. No, at least not other than the rowing. Right. The, <laughs> yes, the crew portion of it. Uh, how, how important was it being on the agent side of things, uh, considering what you ended up doing? You know, I think it helped. It, it certainly early on in my career, like I, I, there's agents to this day that I work with on, on this side of the table who remember, I don't know, it's been over 20 years than when I was on the other side. Uh, but certainly early on, I think it helped in terms of my understanding of the player's perspective and some of the pressures that the agent is under and the competing forces that sort of pull at players and agents when they're trying to negotiate a deal. Uh, probably had a little bit more empathy for that side, having done it for a few years than uh, perhaps some of my peers on this side of the table might have. Uh, certainly, it was a good experience. Uh, for me, personally, it just wasn't enough about uh, building something for the, you know, it, it was, it was fun to see a young player develop and have success. And you're fortunately somewhat diversified on that side of the table when some guys are failing, other guys are succeeding and you can enjoy their success. Um, you know, but what I, what I really wanted to do was more be a part of, of trying to win something. And that's why I continue to be pulled to sort of this side of the operation. It's a tricky question and you can take it in any direction you want, but the relationships you build with prospect prospective free agents uh, uh, on your club and then free agents who you want, might want to bring in, do you look at a player as this is all the people around this player, it's, it's the player in the middle, and the agent is someone – who can speak for that player, but really ultimately the core of it is the player versus 
you have a player and you have an agent, so mm-hmm. you're trying to kind of play both of these sides of it. Do you kind of look at it as the ultimately it's all about what the player wants? Ult- uh, ideally, yes. Certainly there are exceptions to the rule where the agent perhaps has a little more control steering things or the player's a little more agnostic about mm-hmm. where things go in terms of uh, where they play or ultimately just I want to be here for whatever reason. Uh, ideally, and in the relationships that we try to build with our guys you have an understanding of what's important to the player and the player's family and what motivates that individual and and try to show why the White Sox are the proper fit for that doesn't always work obviously Mm -hmm. Um, but we hopefully certainly at least with our guys have that level of trust and relationship the agent plays obviously a very important role especially when it starts coming to the economics uh, but ideally the player feels that level of comfort with us that they can come forward and, and whether it's someone on the coaching staff or someone in the front office and sort of talk through priorities or why, why they're feeling they need more or why they're satisfied with what they're getting. And, and I'm not, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't have a dog in the fight, but do you think most agents truly represent what at heart the player wants? And are there times when you feel like you know the player and there might be an agent that you feel doesn't quite get what the player wants? Uh, to answer your, the first part of your question, absolutely. I, the, the vast, vast majority. It, it, it's a, they know it's a talent-driven industry that, and business that they're in, and if they aren't serving their client's interests, there's six other guys lined up who are more than happy to swoop in and, and serve that role. Uh, there's, there's certainly been occasions over the years where uh, – you hear something from player X and the representative is telling you something very different and you have sort of figure out, okay, I think the player's being honest with me and being direct, but wouldn't imagine he wouldn't be in this instance. So why is the agent doing this? And uh, again, it's, it's, uh, and maybe this is, goes back to my experience. Again, it's been over two decades, but you understand what type of pressure these guys are under and the competitiveness of that industry is rough. And, uh, ultimately, they want to do good deals and, and make their players feel like they added value. So you get that and you try to work with them in a way that makes it so that everyone can win in the end, ideally. We hear so often about all the information that's uniform around baseball and everybody's trying to do the same thing with players and strategy. How wide is the range between the 30 teams in Major League Baseball? It, it's tough to answer from my chair because it's just I get to see one sure, sure. Uh, but talking cert- to general managers and getting to know people you know it, it's I, I a couple of things one I feel like the differences are narrowing uh, in terms of the access what information is accessible okay I feel like those differences between rich club poor club stat club scout club whatever however buckets you want to uh, segregate them I think the differences are narrowing The only, I think the biggest differences now is how the information is used in that how important it is to the decision maker. How how much do they rely upon this specific piece of information that another club may not view as important. Uh, You know, I've had clubs in trade talks tell me, uh, well, we value what you're offering at $103 million and what you're asking for we value at $114 million. And that's fantastic. That's their system. Uh, I can't really debate with them their system because Mm -hmm. it's just their proprietary way of evaluating player value. Uh, Out of, for my own entertainment, I I did once try to engage with a guy and be like, okay, well, this, you said this is worth 103 or whatever that I offered. And this player on free agency, who you didn't get, I know you offered 172. Uh, what's where's the 67 million dollar gap? Just out of curiosity, I didn't think I was going to change the guy's mind, but I wanted to try to figure out how they're how they go about their process. Or what'd you get back? Uh, emoji? Uh, no, this was this was a phone call. This was old school. This is a phone call. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he had his reasons. Uh, didn't make a ton of sense to me in the end, and I made part of me think that. 
maybe someday when I'm negotiating a trade with someone, I should just start throwing out, well, I value this at 57 million and yours at 83 million, so we can't do this unless you're going to send me 20 million or something uh, to see where it goes, because maybe that's just a tactic in all of itself, in of itself. Um, but uh, again, each team, I think, approaches their decisions slightly differently and what information they rely upon uh, is what creates the differentiation. I don't know if the data per se that is accessible to all of us is that vastly different anymore. I'm sad to say that this is a very applicable question to the 2021 White Sox, <laughs> but I'm wondering what happens in the immediate aftermath, especially with a general manager, after an injury. Uh, you know, it, 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 that's one thing, and it just pivots back a little bit to what we were talking about over, earlier in terms of my behavior during games. Yeah. And I'm worse in spring training than I am during the regular season in terms of my behavior, which may come as a surprise because those games are meaningless, obviously, and these games matter greatly. Uh, but my kids will tell you when they're sitting next to me and there's a pop-up in spring training – all you're hearing, all they hear out of my mouth is careful, be careful, call it, watch out. Like, all because the last thing I want to see is, you know, perhaps a guy try to rob a home run and rip his armpit uh, <laughs> during a spring training game. Because those, uh, that's what leaves a hole. That Those are the ones that really hurt. Now, you get past it, but, you know, when I get that phone call, uh, you know, usually from James Crock or perhaps uh, one of our doctors uh, saying, yeah, it's bad. You know, it's going to be months. It's going to be surgery. It's going to be this. Uh, those are the ones that, you know, leave a bit of a void. And you feel like, yes, there's opportunity for other guys. And you can look back at the Aloy injury and be like, boy, maybe Yerm doesn't get the chance to show what he can do if it weren't for that injury. We don't know, but okay, that's a viable uh, viable argument. So there's some potential upside. Uh, but day one or hour one when these things happen, yeah, that that hurts because you start feeling like, boy, we had a, a lot of people put a lot of time and hours into uh, crafting something and the hole just got blown through it. And that that that's the lowest point. That's the worst. You can lose a tough game. You can watch a decision not executed properly or strategy not executed properly and cost you a ball game. But you, like you, like I said earlier, you get to come back the next day and usually by batting practice, you've been able to shake that feeling off. Uh, an unexpected injury that that is going to meaningfully affect your win expectancy for the season, you start feeling the, the grandeur of that, that, you know, scouts, player development people, coaches, trainers, all the people, salespeople who have marketed this team. All the people, not even to mention the fans and the uh, the time and effort they've put into supporting the team, you, you you feel the magnitude of that. So that's 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 the low point. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I'll be I'll show myself out. <laughs> Is there a sense of decorum among your peers? And I'm not talking about a friend in the game who will mm -hmm. text you, "Hey man, so sorry, I I heard the mm -hmm. news." I'm talking literally. Somebody blows out a, 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 an ACL out for the year, and you're thinking. I have exactly the person this this guy needs. Um, do you wait two days? Uh, do you get phone calls immediately after one of your guys is out for you know, twelve to sixteen weeks? <laughs> what is that period like where you have to? I you got to play it very carefully, right? You do, and and usually the the phone call or text begins with, "Look, don't mean to be a vulture, but." Uh, I have this guy. Uh, I will say I, I, I hear from agents much more quickly than I hear sure. from my fellow GMs after an injury. Uh, I've heard from agents when players have left games, like before we have any diagnosis on how long they're down, saying, saw so-and-so lost the, left the game. We have some, this person still available. Uh, so there's a little less decorum on that side, perhaps. But among uh, GMs, uh, Within a day or two, it's usually understandable. And, and we all know that no one's celebrating the injury. Nobody's trying to take advantage. But when there is a excess somewhere and you see a, a counterbalancing need that can be addressed, it's perfectly reasonable to reach out and say, hey, have you given any thought to so-and-so for this type of player? It's way better than our industry. Somebody says something stupid on a microphone, it's like five minutes later. <laughs> People are calling oh. about the job. 
Well, those conversations have already been had when, when all is well. And That's, so they have a list. The seeds have been planted <laughs> already. Yeah. I never thought it's we time would time to harvest be. quick. Yeah. And nobody even says not to be a vulture You're right. in our industry. Um, what do you hate about baseball on television? Other than the broadcasters? Yeah. Uh, it was a lob for you. That was too easy. That was too easy. What do I hate about baseball? As you watch a game on television, what do you think the medium could do better? But uh, hmm. I'm the wrong person for that. And here's why. Because in, in the last couple of years, it's been more difficult for broadcasters to do what I'm about to complain about. And that is... Uh, it drives me nuts when a broadcaster presumes the thinking behind a, a trade, a roster move, even a managerial decision, because they have access, at least pre-COVID. Now, it's great on a scale. But what drives me personally nuts is if I'm watching a broadcast and I know a guy hasn't asked the question. Like, yeah. they called up this guy, or this guy's getting the start, or this guy's not available to pen, and they haven't asked the manager, the GM, pitching coach, whomever, the logic behind the decision. That that I don't like. I don't feel like they're doing their duty to inform a, 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 their, their audience. Uh, it's become more difficult in, in COVID, obviously. From a broadcasting perspective in general, again, I try to look at it through my, my kids' eyes and... and uh, this is not to not to be too uh, too over the top, but they're they're lucky to have broadcasters like the two of you and Steve Stone and DJ to help educate and entertain at the same time. Especially, look, the last few years prior to twenty twenty for our club, uh, you know, it was a rebuild, and I feel like the our our broadcast partners did a very nice job not only making what we were putting out there on a nightly basis somehow entertaining but show glimpses of the future and also cover the minor leagues and the development and sort of invest fans and in, in the audience in what was coming and now over the last few months first few months of this season and the few months we had last season as we're finally starting to bear the fruits of that uh i feel like you know white Sox fans are fortunate to have both of you gentlemen and your partners um, able to, again, entertain and educate as you teach the game, the next generation. Like, I'm not the target audience for me. I, I don't believe I'm the target audience. I don't believe, you know, some dude watching the game on his couch is, is necessarily the audience. It's, for me, being, I'm not saying I'm right, it's my kids. It's teaching that next generation about the game and entertaining them and growing the game. In an effort to show that I'm not fishing, uh -huh. for compliments, Len, what do you hate about general managers? <laughs> no. uh, I'm not answering that. What do I hate about general managers? Yeah, what, what, what do you I think they can do better? Because Jason has an answer, obviously. Well, he He's does. just setting up saying, He's well, what do you think, think, Jason? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think you're taking me for a different kind of person. Here. I, I, I have a comment. I, th I think, Rick, you're, you're completely correct. Um, it was very hard early in my career to ask why, because... Uh, and, and I think managers and, and general managers and team presidents have gotten way better at the why questions. Mm -hmm. For me, the why question is, I want to learn. I want to know. And there have been moments in time in my career where I ask why, and it comes off as a, you didn't agree with that? And it's like, yeah, right. There's yeah. nothing, you know, it, yeah. it, 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 I'm being, I'm being Switzerland here. I'm just, right. you know. As and in like, why did you bunt there? Correct. Yep. I want to know why things happen the way they do. And. Uh, so I can explain to the fans exactly. and teach the kids, this is, this is the thought process. And I think our job is much more about that than it is saying whether I agree with it or not. Now, that's mm -hmm. the part of it that I think is the entertaining part. Mm -hmm. um, and we all have our baseball opinions, but, but it's critical that when you're doing a game, you know the rule book, you understand generally uh, what a manager is thinking, what players are thinking, and if I f see something that I'm not sure of, I always make an effort the next day to ask. See, and that, that's, that's great. Jason can learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to divert here for a moment because I, I really, I truly do not know the answer to this question. Uh, there's this game show in Great Britain called Mastermind where okay. you get to pick a topic 
and they quiz you on your topic very specifically. And oh. they have this whole tournament for like a million dollars across mm -hmm. the country. So I want to know if you were going to be quizzed on a specific topic that has oh, nothing geez. to do with basketball. Basketball? Uh, it won't be, it won't be basketball. basketball. Yeah. Baseball. It'd nothing baseball to do with baseball. <laughs> or basketball. Or basketball. <laughs> I'm so excited about the question. <sighs> nothing to do with baseball. What is, what is the one topic Rick Hahn would choose that he has the greatest depth of knowledge at? Oh, boy. It's funny, and I will answer your question in a moment, but... Obfuscating. I am obfuscating. That's, that's, uh, his, that's his topic, actually. Is <laughs> we're going to ask questions about obfuscation. <laughs> My wife gets on me, understandably, because she says I don't have any hobbies and that I'm not going to do this job forever. She may know more than I do. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to obviously do this job forever, and I'm going to need something to fill the time or keep me from bugging her or the family and keep me occupied. And, uh, you know, why don't you go golf more? Why don't you, you know, pick up sailing or whatever? And I, I do none of it because I spend, you know, way too much time obsessing over, over this job uh, and has have now for 20 plus years. So I'm going to have to like revert back to probably like either 90s hip hop or you know, probably 90s movies in pop culture would probably be the call right now. Like definitely the Orange Square on Trivial Pursuit. That's where yeah. we're sticking. Yeah. Uh, but that's, uh, and that was going to be wholly unsatisfying to everyone in my household because they know I got to go find something to do because <laughs> I'm not going to be doing this forever. <laughs> 90s hip hop, your wheelhouse is what? Like what's on <sighs> the iPod shuffle? Well, I, could, I should actually grab it. We could just go through it right now. We no, should. I'm not going to do that. You don't want to do that. Uh, look, uh, it's, I mean, it's Jay Z. It's 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 uh, it goes back to Run DMC, the Beastie Boys. Uh, it's funny, Ricky. You you'll remember when on certain plane flights, Ricky would bring out his, Ricky Renteria would bring out his boombox. Yeah. And he'd always turn to me whenever a Jay-Z song would come out. He'd be like, this is for you. This is for you, boss. I'm like, I like more than just Jay-Z, but this, thank you. <laughs> so that's why I, my mind always first goes to Jay-Z. Thanks to Ricky. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not, as, I'm not as interesting as I should be. How's that? That's, I don't, I don't uh, like the self-loathing component of that. That's well, something what, for me to work on, maybe. Uh, what happens if one of your kids becomes a sports announcer? <laughs> Well, they've had one of my kids have had both of you on his, on yep. their uh, high school podcast, so thank you for that. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. There was a time when my older son Jacob was younger that I thought perhaps this could be uh, the route his life goes, but I, I don't think so anymore. I don't mm -hmm. think so. I I actually think it would be a, a you guys know better than I do, and we can flip the table on this thing here. But we're not uh, doing this. <laughs> I actually think it would be a, a, a wonderful life. Because you get to be close to the game, you get to inform and educate and entertain. And here's the thing, the part you're not going to like is I know you guys feel the wins and losses, but I'm guessing you can shake it off a bad loss a little more quickly than I can, for example. Mm -hmm. So I've, just, I've for years, I've looked at the broadcaster role and be like, maybe that was the better route <laughs> for the, <laughs> the passion about oh, the game and wanting to be part of the game, but not, you know, being up wandering my house alone at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I've, had one of the, I've had one of the best pitching coaches of all time come up to me, and it was probably 12 years ago, and said, if your partner ever wants to retire, will you give me a call? Because that job looks stress-free. <laughs> I said, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> I only have one other question for you, Rick, mm -hmm. and that is, and I don't know if it's if 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 you can come up with a name on uh, top of your head, but who's the most impressive person who's ever known who you were without you telling them? Have you ever had someone come up to you and say, "I know who you are," and you're like, "You know who I am?" There there had to have been a couple of those moments. You know. I think that when I met Cal Ripken Jr., mm. uh, and, and that was probably the only time for some reason, I don't know what it was. I mean, I, obviously, I didn't grow up an Oriole fan. Uh, he was obviously a star when I, in my, during my formative years, but there were a lot of stars during my formative years. For whatever reason, I was just in awe 
and and that that like I was the one of the few times whether I was on the agent side or this side of the table where I met a player and I was just like frozen and I and I don't I don't know if it was because I remember so many you know triumphant parts of his career when he was uh you know the the standard for not just answering the bell every day as a ball player, but for almost like who you wanted your kids to grow up to be in terms of work ethic and professionalism and how they comported themselves. But yeah, Ripken just, that, that one hit different. I don't know why, but that, that one stands out. Um, yeah. That's a great answer. Yeah. Last thing for me, it's sort of the, like that question. Coolest person in your phone? <sighs> Bo Jackson? Mm. Yeah. Frank? Uh, oh, I should have said my wife. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> She's trying to get you a hobby. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, She's so trying to get me a hobby. No, I'd say Bo. I mean, look, yeah. Bo, we were years ago, we opening day, and you guys, if you've been up to where we sit during normal games, you know, we have Jerry Reinsdorf has a suite. The baseball operations department has a suite. And then there's like this little four person suite that connects them. And so we, you know, we travel back and forth during games, but like opening day, there's it, it's, they're both packed to the gills. And, and as we alluded to earlier, I don't behave well during games. So one opening day I went in, I took my two kids had to be six, seven, eight years ago. They were younger, went into the little room and just closed the door. So it's the three of us. Then there's like a knock on the door. Guy walks in, it's Bo Jackson and Bo sits there and it's me, Bo and my two kids watching the game for like the next five innings just shooting the breeze talking about the game and it was great they you know he gets up walks out he goes somewhere else and I said to my boys I'm like you know who that was right and they're like is that Bo Jackson I go yeah and they go hmm. I'm like no that was the greatest athlete of my lifetime and may well be the greatest athlete of your lifetime and like in fact when we get home we're watching a 30 for 30 on Bo Jackson you're going to appreciate how you just spent the last 2 hours of your life. I don't know if they appreciate it or not but I sure as heck did. <laughs> well you know what I didn't tell I have one more question who are you trading for? And uh, when it looks like and we're, why? looks like we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. that TV play by play man for a bag of balls. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, go find the uh the keys to the batter's box. <laughs> Rick, thanks so much for joining Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thanks it's for having pleasure. me, guys. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it.